Official. No, those aren't mine. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, apologies for running a little bit late. We had an executive session uh, just coming back from that. So, uh, so we already had a roll call. Um, uh, we're turning to open session. And the first item on our agenda is a, a report, some comments from the high school advisors. So Honor and Olivia, if you want to come up. They've been doing, they've been our high school advisors all, all the uh, academic year. This is their last time they graduate in a few days, so congratulations. <laughs> Thank um, you. So they're going to give a, an, an update on the high school, but I, I've also asked them to make a few comments if they, if they want to about kind of the role that they've had as high school advisors and even, you know, uh, one suggestion that's been brought up is whether we might think about having a kind of non-voting member on the school committee, which some school committees do that. I know that Bill Ricca does it where Dr. Galson was before and I think we're actually, what district? Was, uh, Northboro South. Northboro Southboro does it as well. So if you want to comment on that, you can, but I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so um, we just have some updates about what's been going on at school. Um, so the first thing is that like there's been a lot of testing at Watertown High School recently, um, just like a very like intense environment. Um, a lot of people had like various AP tests, um, which was obviously over at the Phillips School. Um, and then many other underclassmen also engaged in the MCAS and iReady tests, which we heard went very well. So that's good. Uh, another thing that we just had was the spring concert, and Watertown High has an annual spring concert, and this year we heard it brought a big crowd, and it was incredible. And they work really hard, and I know that they go late at night during the week to practice, and I heard that it was a very good concert. Um, and then we also just had the, more, the Memorial Day Assembly, which was like a really beautiful like ceremony and celebration of uh, honoring local veterans and stuff like that. And it was nice to see like the chorus come together, the band come together, and then also like students in Mr. Gustafson's um, AP US history class like take initiative and organize the entire thing, like make videos and stuff. So that went really well as well. Uh, another thing is spring sports are coming to an end right now. And I know that all the teams had great seasons, and some are still practicing because of tournament, like boys lacrosse, track and field, boys and girls tennis, and girls lacrosse, and more. And we actually ha both play lacrosse, and we have a game tomorrow against Weston, so we're excited for that. And we're hoping for the best for all the other teams involved, too. Um, and then also very recently, um, the seniors had both the athletic awards night, but then also like the regular awards night. And um, it was just like it made us so proud to see like all our classmates um, and all their accomplishments throughout the years. Um, and it was a great opportunity for everyone to like get their moment to shine. And we just wanted to like extend our thank you to everyone who gave out awards and made the two nights possible because they were so amazing. Um, and we heard that there was like over a hundred thousand dollars in scholarships awarded so it was just like a really big deal um. uh, last Friday we had our senior prom which was at the Venezia ballroom and restaurant in Boston and it was very fun and everyone that went including all the underclassmen and seniors had a really good time and we are so grateful for all the teachers who came and student council for putting it all together um, and then just a few things coming up in the near future um, at WHS. We obviously won't be there, but um, we're like really excited for the juniors as they get ready for junior crews. I know they're all looking forward to that, and we had a great time last year. Um, and then we also want to like wish everyone who's still in school the best of luck on their finals. Um, we know that people are like starting to get nervous and study up, but like we know they'll do a really good job. So. Uh, so our senior year has come to an end at actual school, but this week started off senior week. So today our class went on a trip to Kimball's and we have a field day and cookout coming up. And then on Friday is our actual graduation, which we're hoping is outside of its nice weather. <laughs> um, and we also are looking forward to see where everybody goes and how they do next year at school. Um, and now we're just going to each like share our plans for next year and then kind of reflect on our time um, presenting here and then also like give the advice and like our thoughts on the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, so next year I'm going to Endicott College in Beverly, Mass. And I'm going to be studying nursing while playing field hockey there. And I actually just found my roommate, so I'm excited to get to know all the new people. And I'm excited for orientation in June. 
And um, presenting to the school committee has been an amazing thing to be a part of because it really helped me like personally with my public speaking because <laughs> at the beginning of the year I was a little bit nervous to come here. Um, <laughs> I also think um, for like the future with school committee and students being involved that it would be really cool if like you were mentioning students could hold a position, a non-voting position and be more involved with everything going on. Um, I agree with everything she said, obviously. <laughs> so I will be attending Tulane um, in the fall for political science and communications. Um, and I'm also looking forward to like all the service opportunities in New Orleans because I'm really into that. Um, so that'll be exciting. And then in my opinion, I think that I had such a great time doing this and it's been like run very well. Um, I think it would be really cool to have like two different students each week so that you guys could see like a very diverse perspective because I know like we did the best job that we could like talking about everything, but it would be so nice to have like people in band, people in like different, you know what I mean, like different areas. Um, and we just thought that that would be a cool way for like more people to get involved. Um, and yeah, we just wanted to like thank you guys for having us this year. We had a really good time. Um, and also thank you for acknowledging us at the Senior Awards Night. That really meant yes, a lot thank to you. us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. You've done a great job. So thank we, I want to thank you. <laughs> So qu questions or thoughts from school committee members? Sure, Kendra. I just wanted to say thank you and good luck. You add a lot to these meetings and it's so helpful for us to really have a different kind of connection to the high school. So we really appreciate you and thank best of luck you. next year. <laughs> so, uh, Lily. Just to echo Kendra, you guys are the highlight of these meetings. It's just so great to hear a student voice and to hear the excitement and the passion that you guys bring, not just to what you guys do, but to what your whole community does. And it's really been an excellent, excellent experience. And congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Yeah, so I mean, I appreciate your thoughts too on, on kind of the structure and all. I and mean, that's an interesting idea to have different people come um, each week with kind of some different perspectives from different parts of the high school. And we'll talk about the idea of you know, having somebody here. One of the concerns I have is that the, it's a considerable time commitment mm -hmm. for someone to, to serve here. And so I would be a little conservative about concern uh, for someone like in athletics, mm -hmm. you know, because that would be a little bit harder to do. And so how you navigate that, although it's done. Yep. I mean, there are some school districts that do that. And I mean, it gives somebody an opportunity to, to kind of delve in more detail in terms of what's going on here. And, um, you know, as the next couple of years uh, move forward, uh, also the school building committee, which, you know, uh, Mark Sedaris is the chair of, I mean, that's going to, right now we're focused on the elementary schools, but it won't be long and we'll be focused on the high school. And so kind of getting student input into that will be very important. Mm -hmm. And there'll be different ways to structure that. Yeah. But I wish you all the best. Thank you you color you. coordinated today? Was that? <laughs> we actually it weren't. Was, yeah, it was an accident. <laughs> it was an accident. <laughs> That's horizontal, okay. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for, for coming uh, to all of our sessions and we wish you all the best. Thank, thank you. you. Good luck. Um, next would be the public forum. Anyone wish to speak in public forum? We also have a public forum at the end of, the, of our meeting. Anybody? Okay. Uh, then we have uh, uh, several different recognitions. Uh, this is kind of a, we often do recognitions at the end of the academic year which we're coming up to here. And the first is the, the valedictorian and the salutatorian. And I think the headmaster, the principal, is going to speak to that. Ms. Lundberg. So the valedictorian and salutatorian are on the Kimball's trip right now. Right, so that's, they that's, are not here, but they were happy to submit a statement. So let me tell you a little about them and read their statements. Our valedictorian for 2019 is Joshua Theodore. Joshua is a diligent, focused, dedicated, thorough, and industrious student. Those words are directly from his guidance counselor. As you will hear in his personal statement, Joshua made a decision to overcome some early deficits in his educational career, and clearly he has overachieved, now being named valedictorian of the class of 2019. He, on the side, is an active member of the Watertown High School First Robotics, which is a very vibrant group. Um, he has run either cross country or track all four years. He's a member of the WHS Photography Club, he volunteers as a peer tutor. He's a member of National Honor Society. And he was named a Questbridge Scholar, which affords him a full ride to Princeton University. Pretty cool. See what happens when you go to Watertown High School? <laughs> uh, so this is his statement. 
Dear Watertown Public School Committee, thank you for the kind invitation to address the committee. My name is Joshua Theodore. Next year I'm going to study aerospace engineering with a concentration of entrepreneurship at Princeton University. Although I did not start my educational career in the Watertown Public School System, I am fortunate to have been part of it for six years. I remember when I first entered the system in seventh grade when my academics were severely lacking. All of my classes were at the lowest level possible and it probably would have stayed that way had it been any other school system. I would know because I attended a new school almost every year after kindergarten. In seventh grade, I made the decision to improve my grades. The most instrumental tool in doing so was the progress reports I received every three weeks which detailed every assignment in each of my classes and gave the exact breakdown of my grades. With this tool, I was able to make a plan to do better in school. I realized the importance of participating in class as well as turning in every assignment on time. After implementing my plan, I quickly saw my grades improve. By the middle of the year, I was getting A's and B's. My teachers saw my potential and decided to take a chance on me. They moved me to the advanced math and science track and set me on the path to success. I love that the American dream lives on at the Watertown Public Schools. It doesn't matter where you start. If you put in the work, you can climb your way to the top. So now you asked for suggestions, so now you will okay. get some. No institution is perfect. As a student at Watertown High School, I feel obligated to express my opinion about the math curriculum at Watertown High School. In my time here, I felt limited by the limited range of math courses that were offered. While visiting colleges, I met students who were ahead of me in mathematics and took courses like linear algebra, calculus BC, differential equations, <coughs> and other college level courses. I know some of these courses are offered on virtual high school. However, it is more helpful to have a teacher present in the classroom to aid with the challenge of the subject matter. In addition to this, the math tracks may have to be adjusted to accommodate the addition of math courses. I believe this will give Watertown students a competitive edge beneficial for the college application process. I believe granting Watertown High School students more freedoms would make for a more mature student body that is better equipped to handle the challenges of life after high school. In addition to maintaining senior privilege, juniors should receive the same privilege during the last quarter of the year. A program should also be set in place for students to be able to have food delivered to the high school. <laughs> Although I could not be here in person, I want to thank you for the opportunity for my voice to be heard at this meeting. Sincerely, Joshua Theodore. Great, great. Nathan Follett is our salutatorian. Uh, he was before you once before as a commended student from the National Merit Scholar Program. He, is an, he received an AP Scholar Award, which means he got a three or higher on at least three AP exams. He's a men member of the National Honor Society, a captain of the varsity cross-country team, was a 2018 Middlesex League All-Star in indoor track, a 2018 Division V state champion in the 4x4 relay. Varsity Outdoor Track, 2018 Division IV State Champion, again in the 4x400 Relay. He's a reporter and sports editor for our newspaper, The Raider Times. He attended the Harvard Crimson Summer Journalism Academy in the summer of 2018. He was a legislative intern for Rep Representative Jonathan Heck during 10th grade. He is a member of the Har Harvard Peer Leadership Group at our high school, which is taught by Harvard grad students. He is a student broadcaster for WCAC-TV for Watertown High School basketball. He's a member of Teens for Trees in the summertime, which is a division of the Trees for Watertown. And he did a summer internship at Biogen, working in the lab, modifying DNA and creating protein. And his statement, also with suggestions. I would like to thank the school committee for their recognition tonight. Next year I will be attending Cornell University to study environmental engineer, engineering in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Watertown High School was my first Watertown public school experience and I really enjoyed my time here, especially the wide range of high level classes available to take for students. There were always resources available and the people to talk to when I needed guidance. I do think that the attendance session policy that was implemented this year was a little harsh, especially seeing the rush of people at the end of the year attempting to fill their sessions so that they could graduate. I hope an alternative or modified system could be put in place for future students. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Those are, those are great statements. Yeah. Um, we will hear more from them on Friday, correct? You will. Yeah, they both give, they both give uh, Maybe they'll talks. get food delivered. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or comments from anybody? 
So it's unfortunate that we, it did, the timing didn't work out that they could be here in person, but I, this is the first time at a school community meeting we've had the valedictorian salutatorian, which I think is a, you know, a nice way to have those recognitions at the end of the year. So thank you, though, for, uh, Ms. Lundberg, for putting all that together. No problem. I think it was the lack of snow days that caused the conflict. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, next item on the agenda in terms of recognition is the winter sports. I think Dr. Galson is going to speak briefly to that. Yes, we, we wanted to make sure that we, um, we have one, one individual that we want to recognize from the winter sports, and then on June 17th, we will do a round of the spring sports as well. Okay. Um, the individual we think is actually running at this point in time in a decathlon, potentially, so um, that's why he, he is not here. So um, I'd like to share just a little bit about Mange Kamara. Um, Mange had a historic 2018-2019 indoor track season. Mange won the state championship in the 55-meter and the 300-meter races this winter. He also won the 300-meter sprint at the All-State Meet with the third fastest time in state history. Mange won the 300-meter sprint at the New England Championship. He placed fifth in the 400 meters at the New Balance National Track Championship. Mange was named an All-American as well as an All-Scholastic for both the Globe and the Herald, respectively. Mange went undefeated in every head-to-head -head race for the winter season, including nationals. He broke the school record in the dash, the 300-meter sprint, and the 400-meter race. Next year, Mange will be running for Northeastern University. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Um, what, a, what a night to hear all this yes, about our students. Yes. Um, and then item C is the uh, recognition for the retirees from the Watertown schools. And we're very, very happy. This is something we, we do every year. Um, and we're very happy to, to uh, um, acknowledge and recognize all the people that have put all the years into. I, I did it. We have 13 individuals. Not everybody was able to make it, but 13 uh, total uh, for 278 years across all of them. Uh, and they range from nine years to 33 years by my record here. So some people have put a lot of time in, and, uh, uh, and, and dedication into the Watertown Public Schools. We appreciate that very much. And I think what we're going to do here, um, I'm going to go sit over there. We have a little uh, a gift for each person along with a certificate, and then I'll let the superintendent do the speaking on each. Does that sound good? That sounds, sounds like a plan. <laughs> sounds like a plan. Okay. So we, we have seven individuals here this evening to, um, to honor for their years of service within the Watertown Public Schools. And um, I'm sure that if we could have all the students whose lives were impacted by these individuals here, we would fill the entire town hall. So um, I certainly just want to thank everybody for all that you've done for your students, for your colleagues, for your schools, um, and for the district at large. Um, so we'll start with uh, Jody Delaney. So um, I don't, so John, yes, I, I, I see you. I don't know if John wants to. I'm going to throw them for a curve in a few minutes because they're not all in alphabetical order, but that's okay. So Jody, jo well, no, I'll make a few comments, and then if Jody would like to, that would be great. So Jody Delaney will be remembered as a dedicated instructional assistant and, and the morning program before school coordinator at the Cuniff. Um, Jody was always willing to lend a hand and to support students in order to help them meet with success. She leaves behind many rewarding experiences collaborating with teachers across all grade levels. Best wishes in your retirement. So next, yes. And I failed to mention that she worked for the Watertown Public Schools for 27 years, correct? 35, 35 years. Okay, well, I better check my uh, information because that's, ha, huh. so we'll make a change there. So um, 35 years, that's fantastic. Uh, so the next person that we're going to recognize is Mary Horrigan. Um, so Mary has spent 15 and a half years in the Watertown Public Schools. Okay, good. Um, Mary, Mary has always looked at students holistically instead of as a number. Uh, she works with students in order to fill gaps they have regardless if the gaps are in language or math. She advocates for students and their families and strongly encourages families to participate fully in the Watertown Public Schools experience. She really gets to know families and works closely with them and she also makes delicious snacks. So one thing I wanted just to add is um, I was amazingly impressed um, having sat in on a few of the team, the grade level team meetings that Mary was always there and fully participating in adding her input no matter what um, to, the, to the grade level team. So thank you, Mary, for your years of service in Watertown. So 
now we're going to go out of alphabetical order. Um, and uh, so we would like to recognize Peggy Riley McDonald, or sometimes maybe known as Margaret, but Peggy, um, for her 29 years of service in the Watertown Public Schools. Okay, good. Um, now, what, right out of the gate, now I have to question all of them. So, um, Peggy worked at Franciscans prior to coming to Watertown. She has often worked with the most challenging and learning disabled students, for example, in our learning support program. Peggy works incredibly hard and has been a leader among the special ed staff at the Lowell. Peggy is always up for the challenge and gets positive learning outcomes from students in her care. She has always been a member of the Lowell Critical Incidents Team and has always been available to provide support in a crisis situation. She is well respected and will be missed by all of her colleagues. Thank you, Peggy. Peggy was also at those grade level team meetings that I would attend, so that's fabulous. Um, next we have Lorianne Kellant, um, and she worked, has worked in the Watertown Public Schools for 33 years. Okay. Throughout her career, Lori Kellant has had a variety of teaching assignments starting in her early years as a, um, not I think the correct term anymore, home ec teacher, to her current assignment of teaching about the varied and diverse peoples and cultures of the world in sixth grade geography. She has been able to inspire and nurture both the neediest and most gifted, the most shy and the most gregarious, the most engaged and the most reluctant. When you speak with her former students, they'll always describe Ms. Kelland in terms that acknowledge that she ran a purposeful class with kindness and humanity, and they know that she respected them and cared about their well-being. Ms. Kelland has leveraged great benefit from her being a longtime resident of Watertown. Her connections with the community, her knowledge of the history of our town, and her many years in the classroom at Watertown Middle School provide an unmatched perspective on the strengths and challenges of our community. She's teaching in the room in which her father taught when the middle school was the West Junior High. I didn't know that. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, her son continues the family tradition of service to our town as a firefighter for the Watertown Fire Department. She continually advocated for her school, her teachers, and her students. Her working connections with parents have created an invaluable and strong first link between the community and the middle school. Thank you. So next we'd like to um, recognize Debbie Kelly, um, who served in the Watertown Public Schools for either 30 or 35 years. 34.7. Oh, 34.7. <laughs> but who's counting? <laughs> Round up. Okay, so um, Deb has honored the students, parents, and faculty of Watertown Middle School for the past 34.7 uh, years with a dedication to those who struggle the most. As a special education teacher, she committed herself to making a difference to those with disabilities. Her tireless advocacy, teaching, and empathetic wisdom blessed hundreds of students over these many years. It is with great honor that we thank her for her commitment to the Watertown community. Thank you. Uh, so next, we'd like to recognize Donna Calleja, um, who's been with our uh, Watertown Public Schools for 18 years. Yes? Good, okay. Uh, Donna is the first to offer help, noticing when a student or a colleague needs a hand or offering it selflessly before being asked. Whether it is a huge undertaking like NEASC or something smaller like volunteering to be the one to go shopping for art awards for the department and to wrap them up and have them ready for awards night, she is always thinking of ways to contribute to the school community and to her students. When talking about what she does for the school community, her focus is rarely on herself, but rather on those she serves. She speaks with such love and passion about every single one of her students and colleagues. She knows them inside and out, loves them for who they are, and then pushes them to be their best selves. Some of her students go off to art school and become professional artists because of the incredible support Donna provides. All of her students, regardless of whether they decide to pursue art professionally, learn to think, to create, and to move through the world with kindness and joy. She is beloved by her students and colleagues and will be sorely missed. We are all better people because we've had Donna Calleja in our lives. I think Donna might have been one of the first people I met here in Watertown, so that, that's for me too. Um, so next we would like to recognize Donna Marr um, with her 29 years of service. Oh, full time. So. So 35 years, fabulous. Good, that works. So Donna Marr has been a part of the Watertown High School community as an instructional assistant for many, many, many years. In that time, she was a tireless advocate for every student with whom she worked. 
Donna is a gentle spirit who always encouraged the students and helped them to build self-advocacy and confidence in all that they do. Donna has also, also has a deep, deep empathy and models that empathy in service to others. Donna has been an integral part of the twice a year trips to Camp Sunshine, which is fabulous. Camp Sunshine is a camp for families with children who have serious illnesses. For many years, she organized trips over Columbus Day weekend in February vacation for our students and staff to join with these families to give them the time to put aside their worries and to enjoy a week of fun and caring. This is an experience that the students and staff at Watertown High as well as Camp Sunshine have grown to love and look forward to and Donna has been a very important part of that. Thank you very much. I think that's it. Yes, I've got everybody. <laughs> so we will make sure that the rest of the folks get their lovely um, memorances of the Watertown Public Schools. So I just, I, after reading this, you know, it's just amazing all that you have done for us. Um, as I said before, um, y it will be hard to fill your shoes. Um, we will try very hard to do that. But I think that given the, the breadth of experience, it's going to take a little bit of time to, for these people to catch up to you guys. So thank you. And we, we will all sorely miss you and wish you the best in your, your future endeavors. Well. Right. well, again, thank you very much for, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you to all the, the educators and all the time that you've put in here. Um, we also, when you saw on the screen, you could see the other people that were uh, also retiring that weren't able to make it tonight. Okay. Um, let me go back to the agenda and the presentations and discussions. Let me have a quick question here on the, the Star Academy. No one's here for that? No, okay. but I, I will. Uh... We, we can wait and do that later. That's fine. Yep. So the presentations and discussions, the elementary school improvement plans. So we'll let those people want to leave, go ahead. Say, I was just worried to leave. texturally to say that you can go. Thank you. So. <laughs> you can go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy Thursday. Thank you. So it just by way of background, last, at our last school committee meeting, we heard from the middle school and the high school on their annual school improvement plan. So tonight, we hear from the, uh, the elementary schools. And I think they're going to each make separate presentations. I don't know if you want to start it off to say anything at the beginning. Yeah, so um, I just want to uh, thank the, the I'm just, we'll talk about this as well, but the site councils who put in a lot of work, energy, and effort to help the um, administration and the teachers and everyone to come up with the school improvement plans. Um, one thing that we'll notice in the elementaries is sometimes you'll hear, oh, the, the, the last principal just spoke about that because one of the things that we're very proud of at this point in time um, is the coherence that we have amongst the three elementary schools. But that doesn't mean that there aren't things that they're doing within their schools that are um, distinct and individual. But um, certainly that is one thing that you'll notice that there's a lot of um, repetition. So we're going to try to move through that because we are doing some fantastic things in all three schools. So I will hand it over to right. Mina who will kick us off. Good evening, everyone. I just want to introduce the people who are um, here this evening who are part of the school improvement plan. I have Christine Rono, reading specialist, Helda Sherina, an ESL teacher, and Jessica Middlebrook, who is a kind of parent. Um, and they participated in monthly meetings with us. The first thing I think I want to do is just on the cover of our school improvement plan, you see some photographs that um, I submitted. And I think the photographs give a nice snapshot of some of the successes we've had this year. And I just want to go through those. Um, in the first row, you'll see that there are two students in the first photo photograph who are partner reading. That's a really important part of Reader's Workshop in the primary grades. And they're sharing, again, working with each other, building fluency, and helping each other develop um, important decoding skills that are a part of the reading process. In the second photograph, you'll see a math workshop model in, fifth, in first grade that enables students to interact one another and also gives the classroom teacher some time to meet with small groups and individual students on particular strategies and skills. The third photograph in the first row is a fifth grade teacher having an individual strategy conference with a student during reader's workshop. In the second row, you'll see a picture of a whole class in a first grade participating in morning meeting. Um, in the second photograph, you'll see that there's rope climbing in the, phys in the gymnasium and students um, supporting one another as they help to build strength and um, encourage one another in, in that important skill as well. And then I just end with a, a photograph of our very successful fitness, fine arts, 
and Family Literacy Night that took place um, several weeks ago. And in a few minutes, Christine Ronald will give you a little snapshot about that as well. So I'm going to start with the kind of elementary school improvement plan. And again, on the first page, I'm just going to try, try to advance. Is it not working? It's a little, oh, there you go. You got it. Working? Okay. On the first page, you'll see that the mission is the kind of school commits to excellence by providing a supportive and challenging learning environment where all children can learn and grow and where community partnerships are the cornerstone of student success. Our core values, again, just like our district values, support excellent equity and community. And again, our school site council members, we have one representing the whole um, group this evening. I don't think this works. I'm just going to the next thing. Thank you. All right. So again, as um, Dr. Galston said a few minutes ago, some of the learning accomplishments at Conniff are learning accomplishments in all three schools. So one of the first accomplishments that I'd like to cite is the implementation of responsive classroom. Again, that's a district-wide initiative. And again, daily morning meetings, strategy-based practices really fostered and reinforced academic and social-emotional competencies in our students. I know last summer, many Many teachers participated in a four-day workshop and they'll be doing so again this year and there was professional development throughout the school year and teachers really start by teaching discipline with students and that social has a social and academic route to it. Um, a second accomplishment is the utilization of effective teaching practices, and this includes a standards-aligned curriculum and progression, data collection and use, standards-based reporting, coaching partnerships in ELA and math, and with also with the Teaching and Learning Alliance, and all of these strengthen teaching and learning. At Conniff, um, we expanded our co-teaching partnership with special educators, ESL teachers, or reading specialists, and all of these help to provide all students with entry points for mastering core curriculum. And then finally, support of the home and school partnership, monthly principal's coffees with a guest faculty speaker, um, and they, those ranged from having the physical therapist or the occupational therapist to kind of come and talk to parents about how to support fine and gross motor skills at home, maybe the reading specialist coming and also talking to parents how to ask students important questions at home and how to reinforce independent reading as well. Um, we had a successful fitness, fine arts, and family literacy night, and Mrs. Sharini in a minute will talk to us about Imagine Learning and how that helped our ESL students, um, and all of these strengthen the home and school link. Go to the next page. Um, so our first objective is to create equitable learning opportunities for all kind of students so that every child is presented with the opportunity to achieve academic, social, and emotional excellence. And again, some of the strategies include supporting responsive classroom training and implementation in order to develop awareness, teach routines and expectations, create engaging academics, and develop a positive classroom community continue curriculum implementation guidelines, and continue to refine and implement a tiered system of support to meet the needs of all students. I'm going to go to outcome two. Again, outcome two states that we support, maintain, and foster a cohesive, coherent, and aligned educational program that promotes high expectations, authorship, and student agency. Um, again, the strategies initiatives include establish and build routines that will support best social and academic efforts, provide a standards-based instruction with entry points that enable all students to achieve mastery, utilize benchmark assessments, unit tests, and iReady diagnostic to inform instruction and instructional groups, and to report on standards-based student proficiency, support best practices that include co-teaching and, co and, co co and coaching partnerships, and establish common planning time for grade level teams. At this point, I'm going to ask my ESL teacher to step in and also talk about a program similar to I, the iReady Diagnostic, but it's called Imagine Learning for ESL students. Good evening. My name is Helda Shunyan. I'm ESL teacher at Caniff Elementary. So um, Imagine Learning. Uh, last year, ESL department purchased Imagine Learning program and conducted a pilot program at Hosmer. This year, we implemented the program all throughout the schools at Watertown. Imagine Learning is an adaptive literacy program for pre-K through sixth grade students. Through playing games and completing short lessons, students improve foundational skills, and teacher and administrators receive reports on student progress. It's an adaptive program according to the student's proficiency and learning pace. 
This, and there is support in uh, 15 languages in the beginning of the program that fades as the students gain more proficiency. To improve the opportunity to learn and practice English, we started Imagine Learning Morning Program at CUNIF. In the beginning, it was um, only once a week on Fridays uh, from 7.45 till 8.15. Shortly, it was offered as a twice a week program with 16 students attending. First day, uh, first day of the program, we had a principal's coffee for parents. Many attended. It was a perfect occasion to meet with other parents, learn about ESL and Imagine Learning program in the district, and ask questions to teachers and principal. It was a very productive and helpful meeting. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn to the next slide. Objective three to promote and encourage cooperative relationships among kind of community members and the strategies and, and initiatives include to issue a weekly principal's letter and host a monthly principal's coffee with guest speaker and Helda just um, alluded to another example. Host evening, -wide, evening school wide events like the family literacy night and math night and support the community service and reading buddies program as well as a summer literacy initiative. And I'm gonna ask Christine Rona, reading specialist to step in. Hello, good Thanks. evening. Um, Christine Rona, reading specialist at the CUNIF. Um, this is my fifth year in this role, and I used to teach um, first, second, and fourth, and fifth grade before that. Um, one of my passions, in addition to teaching reading, is to inspire the love of reading outside of school, and studies show that this starts at home. So at the CUNIF, we have two new initiatives that support getting more books into the hands of children. The first is this summer, we're offering two different opportunities, one in July and one in August, for children and their parents to come to the CUNIF and browse from a selection of books to take home. There will also be treats and places for families to read together outside. The second initiative, and this is uh, thanks to our PTO uh, funding, we'll be installing little free libraries around the school at different grade level entrances. Um, the libraries will have age appropriate books for students and families to take a book and share a book. We hope that the little free libraries will inspire the love of reading and build community around the sharing of books. And we're really excited about cutting the ribbons on those little free libraries on the first day of school. <laughs> All right, the final objective four, provide engaging, purposeful learning environments that support the Watertown Public Schools vision and mission. Our strategies and initiatives include utilizing responsive classroom curriculum strategies to offer engaging academics, build a positive community, effective, effectively manage the classroom, and match instruction to students' developmental strengths and needs. Encourage opportunities for students to think critically and creatively and ensure that classroom environments contain organized classroom libraries by genre, author, topic, student interest, etc., and that books are accessible to students at all times. And finally, continue to display daily schedules, anchor charts, objectives, and morning messages in the classrooms. And that is pretty much a summary of our school improvement plan. I want to end with having parent Jessica Middlebrook just give a little statement in terms of the work that we're doing with equity in the district and at kind of. Sure, I'm Jessica Middlebrook, uh, Audrey, uh, mother of Audrey Middlebrook in kindergarten at the CUNF. Um, I wanted to point out that one of the things that we discussed a lot in our school site council meetings this year were um, both district and school-wide responses to the acts of racism that we um, experienced in the district this year, and we were um, had a lot of conversations about CUNF's response to that. Um, and while we don't have a specific goal within this school improvement plan around anti-bias and equity, um, we will be looking forward to putting something like that in writing and kind of operational a goal going forward, especially along with what is going on with the anti-bias coalition here in Watertown. So I just kind of wanted to let you know that that will be forthcoming next year as part of our work. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I think we'll hold questions until we have all three because there may be there's some overlap between the presentations. So who's up next? The Hosmer. The Hosmer. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Good evening, thank you for letting us come here and talk about our school, it's one of our favorite things to do. Um, this is the Hosmer Elementary School um, Site Council. Uh, parents on the Site Council are Laura Daly, Christine Murphy, and Teresa Flaherty, who are here tonight. Teachers are Jess Donato, Judy Tan, both could not make it, but Melissa Rear and Lawrence Albucci are here. I'm the principal, Bob LaRoche. And our mission statement is dedicated to maximizing individual potential in order to prepare students for a rapidly 
the evolving landscape of educational opportunity, our mission is to develop academically, socially, emotionally, and creatively. We embrace the core values of respect, responsibility, and right choices. Our first um, objective. Objective number one, and this is the part where the redundancy can really um, matter. Standard base report card, iReady, TLA, et cetera. Those things you heard about from Ms. Charloni, and we won't go too far into depth on that, but we are gonna talk a little bit about our reading and our literacy, and especially on school improvement plan, uh, the goal number two, which is reading improvement. I dropped off a small packet in front of each of the members, and if you could just take a quick second to look at that for our accomplishment for reading improvement. One of our goals this year was that the students who are reading more than one grade level below their grade, whether it's grade one, two, three, four, or five, we wanted them to improve, <clears throat> excuse me, by 1.5 grade levels. That would help them to be able to catch up with the other students who are reading at grade level. And <clears throat> one of the things we're happy to say is that they improved 1.46 on average. And as you can see with the scores in front of you, we had scores in third grade and fifth grade that we are especially happy about. Now the fifth grade, all of the students in that um, pie chart that you're looking at are students uh, in the ESL program. And we saw a, a, an incredible amount of improvement for them reading, sometimes five or six levels for some of the students. And we owe that to the work of the teachers, the ESL teachers and the reading teachers, but more that everything now is more aligned. So in talking to the reading teachers, one of the benefits we have of having a common curriculum is they use that curriculum in their work as well. So they're getting more shots at that when they get into the classroom. And the special educators are also using those types of things. So the students aren't seeing it once, but more than one time. And it's not a canned program where it's something separate from the themes that you're using in class. So we kind of chalk that up, and I think that's district-wide, that that's an improvement on bringing the reading levels up. So we're really happy about that. Uh, the makerspace was one of the goals that we had. We wanted to go forward with makerspace, but during the school year, we saw that it was really, uh, we had bit off more than we can chew, and makerspace wasn't possible for every student to participate in makerspace. They did it on grade levels, so we had a choice of either going forward with that or kind of using that as a support, and the district is going in a different direction and a, a better direction that's going to help the teachers in the classroom through digital learning, and we'll talk about that in a little while, too. Um, the next slide, um, goal number three. I believe we're gonna have Melissa Rear is gonna talk a little bit about our communication. And Lauren Salvucci. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Lauren Salvucci. I teach first grade at Hosmer. Um, so one of the first bullets um, is we worked, this year we worked on creating um, a norm for teachers to um, create and send home a newsletter at least once a month. Um, that could be either through email or a notice that was sent to home in students' folder. Um, and during faculty meetings, uh, teachers got to share the format that they use, um, the templates that they use, and what they include in the newsletter. So in the newsletter is um, you know, what they're working on academically, important dates coming up, and just anything that parents should be aware of that's going on in the classroom. Um, so at this point, every teacher is doing that, at least once a month, some teachers do it weekly. Um, and going forward, um, teachers are planning on, at the start of the school year, letting uh, the parents know how and when to expect um, a newsletter. Um, so along with the other schools, we also have the new website and the Facebook and Twitter pages. Um, so we've done a lot of work with that. Um, a um, I do the website and the Facebook and Twitter, and all the, a lot of the teachers send me information and articles and pictures um, so we can ha kind of have a input from the whole school. Um, so that's been really great. Our Facebook page um, went, went from being brand new with zero likes to about 200, um, which we can definitely do more having over 500 kids in the school, but um, we've definitely grown that a lot. Um, we also did um, a literacy night for the first time, which was in February. Um, we had the storyteller Len Cabral come, um, and we also had um, activities and all students left with books and a book bag to decorate. Watertown Library was there so they could um, uh, get a library card and that sort of thing. We also gave a survey at the end of the night um, and 47 people completed it um, and we got really good feedback um, and comments for the future. 
Great. And our um, goal number four was um, one of the highlights that we saw was the welcoming committee. While it seems like a simple thing, it was really quite involved and a lot of people came together to uh, pull that committee together and it was really quite effective. And Laura Daly is going to talk about that. Yes, um, so we made a lot of progress over the last year with the welcoming committee. We established a form that new families could fill out when they register at central office. So they get all the paperwork in one place. They can give us their contact information. And then it's disseminated through the welcoming t committee so that one family or, you know, ambassador, or welcoming committee ambassador can reach out um, and make a personal welcome to the Hosmer. So I did that several times over the year. Um, we try to match by grade level, so if I have a second grader and there's a new second grader, I'll, you know, say, oh, I, you know, you can look for my daughter Violet at the playground, or answer any questions parents would ask me about getting involved in the school when they get to go to their child's classroom. Um, we also developed this welcome guide. Um, Kendra Foley and Judith Tan worked very hard over this over the summer, so it's very comprehensive. It includes really specific things about the school and also the community at large, extracurricular activities, um, extended day, busing, all that sort of stuff. Um, right before the school year started, we held a welcome picnic for families who had already registered but were new to the district. So we had pizza um, at the playground so the kids could play and parents could interact with each other. Also, um, Ms. Fitzgerald, Vice Principal at the Hosmer, was able to create some welcome signs, um, shown right there, um, through the company that does our school photos. So we have those hanging in a couple of key entrances at the school as a visual representation of our welcoming committee. And going forward, we're looking on getting, um, looking to get some more parent ambassadors, especially ones who are multilingual, coordinate with the school and PTO to make a master list of important events that we can reach out and say, Literacy Night is next week, or International Night's coming out, coming up. And we're hoping to get this guide translated into multiple languages so that we can reach as many new families as possible. Can you talk about the club now? Or? Sure. Okay. Um, and I just also wanted to mention that we were continuing our book club from last year, which was hugely successful, um, thanks in great part to the Watertown Free Public Library librarians who came to the Hosmer after school. Um, we expanded it this year to include even younger grades. We had several grade one sessions, um, and then sessions for grades two and three, and four and five. So the younger grades read a picture book every week and did a craft around it. Um, the older grades read a book and talked about it in class and also did some hands-on activities. So it was really popular. I had overflow. I had to keep adding sessions. So we're really grateful that the library um, helped out and hope to continue it next year. Great. And, and Laura's being humble. This was a completely um, parent-run, uh, teacher-supported, but parent-run um, uh, event and, and program, and we're really happy that this was the, the home school connection that we always try, strive for, and it was very effective in this case. And uh, thank you to the Hosmer parents. Um, if you go to the next slide, that would be our current improvement plan. And what um, we're looking at is we've been going year to year for improvement plans. This is, a, I think, a little bit more sensible way to go about it is we're going at multiple years with the same goal. The action plans and strategies are going to change, of course, during the year as well as year to year. But it's a very effective way to continue forward momentum when you get a good initiative going. Our first objective is to increase in-building capacity for educators to provide rigorous, relevant, standards-based curriculum in core instructional practices. And that is, again, some of the things that you're going to see in all of the schools with TLA and some of the opportunities for teachers to plan together to do co-teaching. And the co-teaching looks different in all the schools and maybe at different grade levels, but it's the idea of children being serviced in the classroom without having to be pulled out. Our objective number two, establish practices and support teachers to provide a uniform, consistent, and differentiated instructional model to promote an inclusive learning environment. And this is one of the things that we felt uh, might have been lacking in past years, but in the last couple of years, we've had some really good uh, luck and effect with the teachers that were pushing into classrooms. And again, this is the tier two model that we're always looking at. This is something in between a lot of support and minimal support um, that's needed, and the students are getting SEL, uh, excuse me, SEL services from the guidance in the classroom, ESL services, special education, and also our reading teachers are pushing in as well as pulling students out of the classroom. So we found that to be very effective. 
Objective number three, approve upon and expand the system of communication to provide consistent and effective practices. Again, as Melissa was talking about, it was my privilege to be the cooperating principal as she gets her administrative certification. So Melissa is finishing up to be a future assistant principal. Watch out for Melissa. <laughs> Objective number four, create and promote systems that will support and disseminate resources to maximize organizational success. And that's really letting people know what's happening in the school, the transparency, and making a better home school and home to community, key, community relationship. One of the things that we go through year to year is when parents move on after fifth grade, we lose site council members who have that institutional knowledge. So we wanna be able to train new site council members as they come aboard and also expand it to get more teacher involvement a more varied teacher involvement. And that brings us to the end of our improvement plan. All right, so thank you very much. I just wanna to add to Mr. Loach, thank you for your years of service to the Watertown Schools. And to, <laughs> thank you for all that, that, that you've brought in terms of your own experience and perspectives. We appreciate it very much. Uh, Lowell. Good evening. I'm Stacy Phelan, the principal. I'm here with Candace Whitmar, the assistant principal, and Laura Holman, um, our special education teacher in our integrated support program. We are just a few of the teachers that are here, and we also have a number of parents that are not here this evening, and I will mention who they are. We also have Ann Sudbay, who's a fifth grade teacher who's on our committee, Rachel Levine, who's also a fifth grade teacher on our committee, Kara Collier, who's a parent, Diego Hamishlag, who is a parent, Lisa McDonough, and David Oliver. So those were all contributors this year to our SIP process. Okay, school council. Oh, I can't see with my glasses or without my glasses. Okay, so to talk about some of our accomplishments, I'm gonna uh, start off with um, just saying that um, the introduction of having an assistant principal there was hugely impactful on our culture and just the overall community. Um, she brings a ton of fun with her and makes um, learning even more exciting. She, some of the things that she brought this year that I think were really impactful was um, we started with a community pledge every morning. She makes announcements. She um, really highlights the students in each classroom every morning so she goes to the classroom and the kids come up and they lead the announcements she always leaves us with a wonderful thought to really think about and get excited about the day and I think it's really um, really gets everyone giggling and smiling the first thing in the morning um, one of the other things I think that was a huge accomplishment was around our cafeteria and you know lunch programs it's a really tricky little spot in the building and it's critical place because everybody goes there um, one of the things she's done is really helped with bringing the routines through interactive modeling and also um, giving incentives and now we have dance party Fridays and you really need to come by because the moves are pretty crazy um, and she runs that and I really feel like she's um, brought a ton of um, positive energy to our culture. She's also been very impactful with working with our students for discipline and she has really um, supported our team and I just look forward to growing even further with her. Um, another thing that I think I really like to um, kind of list as a highlight um, that's not really up there but I thought of it today it's been incredibly impactful is the um, kindergarten having um, lunch in the classroom rather than coming to the actual cafeteria. The, we've been able to run a lot of embedded lunch groups in there. We have all, um, all of our support staff um, is asked to um, allocate themselves to the kindergarten so we can all sit at tables. We also have fifth grade going down there running little groups. And um, I think what has happened is just really alleviated some of the stress around um, lunch and actually a lot of time of moving between the classroom and the cafeteria. So those, um, that was a wonderful accomplishment. Candace is now gonna speak. Right. <laughs> so another highlight is our student support team which we've defined roles for our team and included parents to the table. Using the common elements of effective student support that is brought to you by DESI, we use that to like define our um, roles as a team. We also define the process for teachers and staff and grounded in assessment and data analysis. We created a flow chart that builds teacher capacity and intervention strategies. We created a collaborative partnership where everyone at the table has a next step or an action step and must present relevant data at the follow-up meeting. 
and we revamped our referral form. And as a result of all of this revampedness, this year we had a total of 13 initial evaluations compared to previous years with 23. Of the 13 initial evals, only four were found eligible for special education, while nine were not eligible. So this shows that we still have continued work in this area, but we have a decrease in our referrals this year. So I'm going to speak a little bit about our implementation of responsive classroom. I know the other schools mentioned this as well. The district is in year one of this implementation, but what we have done at the Lowell is we had 13 staff attend the training last summer, and this summer we already have 12. 12 staff signed up to attend the four-day training, which is great. Um, from the training from the last summer, we created our own classroom, responsive classroom implementation team. And this team worked with the teachers and faculty in the school to support everyone in the impl implementation process. And they held um, professional development to better help, help the staff embed practices throughout the school. So it's not just the teachers in the classroom who are following these tenants, it's the cafeteria workers, um, the before and after school teachers were really trying to make it cohesive throughout the school day. Um, furthermore, every single classroom was using, was utilizing morning meeting, closing circle, and interactive modeling for teaching procedures and routines, as well as the academic and social skills. Um, we had a number of walkthroughs in the school this year that focused on how our implementation has been going, um, and one kaleidoscope walkthrough to kind of monitor where our progress is at. And then we had a teacher survey for all staff that was given in April to see where we wanted to go next with Responsive Classroom. And this guided us towards our um, learning, our objective that I will speak about in a little bit. Another accomplishment I think this year was um, really making sure that with all of our new initiatives um, to support the teachers, we put in biweekly data meetings, which were both looking at data but also looking at um, instructional practices and planning. And so this was giving um, our teachers an opportunity to meet. Um, they spent 40 minutes with a coach and they would just kind of use that time according to what was happening in the year at that time. So um, it gave everybody an opportunity to actually do a little deeper planning and a little deeper preparation. And it, um, I think it really did um, create a more um, cohesive um, learning team um, or grade level teams and they were able to um, implement different units of study both in mathematics and readers workshop um, at the same time um, really focused on the learning objectives. I won't go on any further because um, pretty much the accomplishments again are similar to the other schools. Kathy's got it? Kathy's yep. got it. Okay. All right. So now we're going to um, talk about um, our, sc our school um, SIP for this year. So looking at um, trying to keep ourselves in line with the district school, um, strategic plan, we are, um, objective number one is to develop and articulate a comprehensive um, K through five multi-tiered system of support for reading and meeting the needs of our diverse population. We really, um, we do have a tier two, um, a tier three inside the school right now, um, but it's really not being driven by a lot of looking at the data and then uh, parsing out, really trying to figure out what are the resources, the human resources and also um, the material resources to actually most affect the students. And also really looking at trying to identify not just the people, but also create um, a structure and a plan for the year. So we are going to be really looking looking at how do we define um, tier two and tier three, because we really spent, I think, the last two years trying to define um, tier one in our core instruction. So that's our um, SIP number one. SIP number two is really looking at continuing our rollout for Reader's Workshop. We'll be focusing on um, kindergarten, grade two, and grade five this year. And um, they will be receiving um, in-class coaching and also professional development, just like the other schools. So those are our um, two goals that I really think are continuing on the work that we've already started. Um, it's just the logical next step for those areas. And um, now I'll let Laura talk. Okay. So I'm coming back to responsive classroom. So this will be our year two goal. Um, we can go to the... 
So year two, we would like to implement responsive classroom strategies focused on teacher language and interactive learning structures. So we pulled those two tenets of responsive classroom from the survey that we had all staff take in April. Um, and those were the two pieces that staff felt that we really needed more professional development on and we could really start to implement more as we dive into the second year with this program. So teacher language, just to define it for you, is the intentional use of language to enable students to engage in their learning and develop the academic, social, and emotional skills that need to be successful in and out of school and interactive learning structures are purposeful activities that give students opportunities to engage with content in active hands-on and interactive social ways um, so we have a bunch of things that we have lined up to really help drive these two parts of responsive classroom like I said before we have um, training happening this summer um, we are buying, Stacey bought for us The Power of Our Words, which is a book about teacher language, and we're going to have a staff book study. And then later we're going to roll that out to parents to have them be aware of the language we're using, um, and we'll run a parent forum. We're also going to roll out and model specific responsive classroom strategies throughout the year during our grade level team meetings and our faculty meetings. We will make teacher language posters to support teacher language and we'll post those in common areas and in classrooms and that way again, anyone in the school who comes in can actively use those models and kind of know what we mean when, we, when we're talking about teacher language. And finally, we're going to develop a resource of purposeful activities that give students opportunities to engage with content in the active and interactive means. Next slide, please. All right, our last objective is objective four, which is to create a more culturally and linguistically environment. And this aligns with the district's um, focus on equity. And so our plans for this initiative, we have Happy in Our Skin, which will be a summer reading for our incoming first graders. Then we also have diversity read alouds in classrooms with whole school initiative, which will roll out to each grade. Then we'll plan a potluck welcome dinner for families with interpreters on curriculum night, um, just to get interest to see who would like to join the diversity council. Then we have a creation of our parent diversity council. Then we'll establish diversity council for students in grades three, four, and five. And then create a more welcoming and inclusive entrance to our school. So those doors you enter, yes, that's our work. And then also, we will keep faculty informed on the district's equity team's work and initiatives. All right. So that kind of concludes our, uh, our uh, introduction to our new SIP and kind of talk about some of our accomplishments and if you want to ask any of us questions. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So let me, let me open up to the school committee for questions, comments on any of the, the three. And we can have the whoever the principal is someone come up uh, to answer those questions comments oh i have some yep you want to go ahead kendra or lily go, go ahead go, go ahead lily i was very impressed by all three presentations um and i have parts of each that i particularly really appreciated um at the conif i'm loving that idea of that lending libraries that you guys are building um definitely let us know when you're going to cut those ribbons um, and I love the idea of just students being able to grab a book and take it home and own that book, which I think is a very different feeling than a library book that you know you have to give back because when you fall in love with a book and it becomes yours, there's kind of a different engagement with that. So I love this idea. Um, at the Hosmer, this welcome committee is incredible. Um, it sounds like you guys have just turned this community into something that is so warm and open to all families that I just really appreciate that you guys have developed something and that parents have taken the lead to do some of this work also, which I think really speaks to that school community um, connection that we're really hoping to see. And at the Lowell, I'm very excited that we're redecorating the entrance. That's going to be very exciting. Um, but also just this commitment, and I love this kind of diversity council because I think that that is kind of something that we're really wanting to see more and more of, but I love the fact that students are going to be on it. Um, I really like the inclusion, especially of these older grade students who are going to be hopefully able to participate and speak to their community in a different way. So I just, I'm really impressed by every single um, school improvement plan and I really appreciate you guys coming out here and presenting them. Thank you. Kendra. Thank you very much for the, all the presentations. Um, there are, I, there is a couple other highlights that I wanted to note as well. Um, the websites, it made a, it's made a huge difference this year to have a point person in the schools doing the websites. I mean, I just, 
I can't tell you the difference I've seen. So, um, it's really been huge. So I know parents really appreciate that. So that work is, um, is, is really wonderful and um, has made a big difference for, for families. Um, the monthly newsletters also at the Hosmer are, are wonderful. I mean, Lauren's one of my, my first graders teacher. And we get a really amazing letter at, at weekly. And I get some, some weekly. Um, I, there are some that still don't get anything monthly, so I think that's something we can t continue to look at. But I, I often get, we get mostly weeklies from teachers, and they're really informative, and they're not long, and they're just incredibly helpful just to know what's going on, to ask the right kind of questions when the kids come home. So that's huge. Uh, for the Lowell, I just wanted to note a couple of things. Um, the lunch in the classroom <laughs> for kindergartners. When can we roll that out to the rest of the elementary schools? Not only, and pre-K, not only because that's amazing for kindergartners, but I know like my third grader loves to when she can have lunch with the teacher. To just to have other options for kids who want to have a break from a little bit of the chaos of the lunchroom is huge. And the, I love the idea that a fifth grader is going down and having that, uh, both a leadership role and a way to have something different and a change and kind of get away from that. And there may be kids who need that change, and it's good for everybody. So I, I love that model, and I really do hope we can, uh, we can roll that out to all the elementary schools. Um, question in the middle school. I'm just going to say it told. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone. Um, question about the bi weekly data meetings and the common planning. Is that happening in all three schools? Because I know you noted that at the Lowell. I'm just wondering if that's happening in all three. So what kind of we don't do it bi-weekly, but we have monthly team meetings where we discuss data and just anything that's on topic in terms of if there was a math unit test or if there was an iReady diagnostic that was, um, you know, that had taken place, then we look at that tool as well. We look at benchmarking, lots of different um, tests that take place during the, the year. We usually focus on that during the team meeting for that month. And it's the whole grade level team, not just classroom teachers. It's special educators, ESL teachers, and um, classroom teachers as well. OK, great. Thank you. And we're similar to the kind of school. We found that the data doesn't change that often mm -hmm. um, on that fast of a, a basis. But there are key times during the iReady testing in the fall, winter, or spring, and then also when the benchmark fought us at Pinnell. So as events come up, that's when we, so we react more to that. OK, thank you. Um, and my last question was just about um, the, this data that you passed out, which is so great to see that kind of growth. Sure. I just don't under, um, I'm having a hard time deciphering the, the, these. Sure. Is this, how many students? So is this the number of students is in parentheses next to it, that, that these are the students that are more than two grade levels below their grade level. So if you're in third grade and you're reading at first or below, you're one of those students. So at the beginning of the year, they were assessed. They were identified, the reading teachers worked with them, the classroom teachers supported what the reading teachers were doing, and the effort was to raise them one and a half grade level so that they could catch up with their peers in the grade. So is the, I'm just, is the number, it's the number and a percentage to the right? Is that the number of students? So I'm looking at grade three just as an example, just so I understand. And these are people, these are the students that started out below grade level entering the year. Yes, Okay. at the beginning of the year. And so. It looks like there, is that nine students total for grade three? Um, which one are you looking at, the left or I'm right? I'm looking at the left, the beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm trying to understand So if you look in the students. yellow beginning of the year benchmark assessment screening, it, there's one student that makes up 11%. So, so the total number student. of students is outside of the parentheses. So six, seven, eight, nine students. So, the, so for, for grade three, Yes. This is a re this this change is reflector for nine students. Yes. And there's only it was only nine who were then this is Fontes and Pinello. There's only nine who were below grade level moving into grade three. More than two grades below. More than two grades right. below. I see. So if you're in third grade and you're not reading at first grade level, you're one of those students that were so seen by the the reading teachers. More than two grades below. Okay, that makes sense. Great. Thank you. Sure. Other question, it's Eileen. It's not really a question, it's just a comment. I found all these reports incredibly exhilarating and I feel that I'm sort of like, um, I've been watching farmers 
and you may have a year in which your planning is all on paper and you're thinking about what is your what is your farm like what kind of seeds you need what kind of equipment and then another year comes and you're you've made your plans and you start your planting and everything and now I think we're entering the period when things are starting to grow and it's just incredibly exciting so thank you for all your hard work and I cannot wait to see when every when we're eating the fruits and vegetables thank you <laughs> other questions yeah mark i just want to say thank you to all three schools and the staff and everything you've done this is a, a huge difference from what we've seen in the past and we appreciate the efforts that you're putting on to do all of these new things and i think the, the students benefit greatly from them so thank you all other comments I'm sorry, Lily. I just also want to say, just a quick aside, um, because we know that there are some community members who can't be here. Um, I just want to wish an Eid Mubarak to all those who are not present um, tonight, who might have wished to come tonight or couldn't come for various reasons. I think it's just important that we acknowledge that it is a holiday today for some people. I know that some people on the site councils are celebrating that right now, so they might not have been able to be here. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Can I um, okay. Sure. Is I'm going to say something too, but go ahead. Oh, no, you I'll, let me say, let me start. All right, go ahead. <laughs> I, all I wanted to say was, I think that, you know, as we go through the years and we, you know, ebb and flow in terms of how we do our presentations, I think tonight we saw a great example of the fact that there are certain things that we're all just doing, and so those were not the items that were highlighted. Um, last year, I think we noticed that, that almost like we're tripping over each other because we were doing so many things in common. So I loved the flavor of tonight being more specific to the schools, um, but knowing that there's a lot of district level, you know, unified elementary efforts that all of the buildings are doing, but we don't need to say those over and over again, and those are on the district improvement plan. So I just wanted to comment on that. Yeah. So my, a couple of quick comments I would make is one kind of relates to that is I think it's an interesting mix when you read through the plans that there clearly are, are a, a variety of initiatives that are, are district wide and across all three schools. Responsive classroom probably be you know, one of the most prominent examples. So, you know, everybody is working in that. But, um, but then it's also interesting to see when individual schools um, have a, a particular, like the welcoming committee, welcoming group, or the diversity council. Or, you know, each individual school is kind of uh, targeting some area that they find particularly important. So I think that you know the, the mix of the two I think is important. You don't want everybody to be exactly the same. I think you know the schools have different cultures and different environments and needs to uh, acknowledge that. The other comment I'll make, and this is the, the kind of, um, I suppose, the, the numbers person in me, is I was, when I, I was particularly looking at the, uh, the goals or accomplishments that you expect, how are you going to measure this? How are you going to know if you accomplished it? And so my, I just encourage all three schools to, uh, to kind of narrow, uh, zone in on that and, and focus on that uh, as you can as the year goes on. So you're collecting information and different sorts of data points that you can turn around a year from now and look back at, at some of the targets and some of the expectations you have and be able to you know, present that in a way so you know, well, we met this one and came close on this one, but not quite, not quite on that one. Because um, there was a range. The, the improvement plans had, a, you know, like the Cunniff, I think, in particular, in the years was more specific. You know, 90% here, 95%, et cetera, and some of the others are kind of a mix of that. And so I think just focusing on those would, would help. And from a school committee perspective, because we're not in the schools like the superintendent and all of you are, so those kinds of data points are really particularly helpful for us to have a sense of kind of what uh, some of the accomplishments are. I don't want to reduce everything to numbers, because that's not the case, but some of those help along the way. Anything else? Other comments? Okay, again, thank you to the, 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 the staff and the community people, the, part, the parents, principals, and everybody who put all the work into this. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next item, we move to the action items. Uh, we have just a couple of action items. John, was it something you said? I, I think so. I, it's, it's not a fire alarm, is it? Or something? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Um, first item on the agenda under action items, the main one is, is uh, compensation for school committee members. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments and then um, uh, Mark is going to uh, say a few words. Um, so this was an issue that was brought up uh, oh, maybe uh, two months or so ago. And uh, this, just as a way of context, the school committee compensations, if people don't know, uh, currently we have a, a salary, uh, I guess we call it a salary, uh, $3,200 a year. And that, was, uh, that has been the same uh, since 2008. So it's been 11 years that it's been at that level. And so the question was raised uh, a couple months ago about whether there should be, uh, should consider an, an adjustment to that. And I asked if there were some counselors, or school committee members that would look at that. And we had three people, Mark uh, was one, and Lily and Amy uh, met and looked at that. And they're going to make a report back. Um, I also sent some information around, which I can uh, uh, speak to in a few moments. But let me ask Mark for, first if he wants to make a few comments from their sure. discussions. OK. Um, the ad hoc committee met on May 6th at 545. We looked at information that, you know, John had sent out some more typical, the same information. We had salaries on school committee members running anywhere from $100 to $6,500 in Woburn, where $2,000 of that was a travel stipend. There were a couple of cities that the compensation is paid by the town. Um, and so they, they, it, was very, it was very varied. So we, we, we had a discussion about the variances, and um, we had dis decided to make a motion to recommend a, a salary for the school committee of up to $6,000. Um, I've had some subsequent conversations with Chairman Ports, and, cha and he put out some information here about what salary increases would look like. Let me also say that in order to do a salary increase for the school committee, it's similar to the town council in the fact that it needs to be done within the first 18 months of the term to take effect the following term. So this would have to be completed by the end of this month. Another caveat to that is the fact that we would need to recommend to the town council a salary adjustment for the school committee. Um, it's a quirk. I spoke to the town attorney many times, but this is the recommended path. Um, I, you know, the, the committee was comfortable in the fact that we haven't had an increase in this since 2008. I want to point out that the council took this action, and on January 1st of this year, the council's, the council's salary increased to $7,500. Um, and in looking through the budget for FY19, another group of people that is getting a salary, some people call it salary, some people call it a stipend, some people call it compensation, it's a salary, you know, for all intents and purposes. The Board of Assessors, and there are three members of that, one is the chair who works full time, but the two members of the Board of Assessors get $5,075. So it's very, a little bit varied, but all similar in the same area um, of with the people that do get compensation. Um, we had some discussions about the timing of this. The timing is critical if it's going to be done. The next opportunity would be, you know, after July 1st, that it would be almost two and a half years before it could be increased again. So um, the committee made that recommendation, and in looking at what John put out, if you look at the annual increase of 2%, and he compounded them out, and because this is a very difficult exercise, my recommendation personally would be that the school committee salary should be increased to $4,500 at this time to take effect in, Actually, my recommendation would be that the school committee request the town council adjust the salary of the school committee to $4,500 to take effect on January 1st of 2020. Okay. Thank Thanks. you, Mark. 
Um, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, one, one addition to your comment, which you said town council has to approve it, and it actually requires uh, two votes, yes. two different meetings. It's so, an ordinance, so we have like we have to advertise it like an ordinance. Yeah, yeah. So that that that's by the the timing is such that we really have if we're gonna if anything if it's gonna change we have to take action uh, tonight. So let me um, just open the floor for comments, discussions, thoughts on this. Yes, Lindsay. Um, the only comment that I wanted to make is that the the only information that we had available about other school committees is extremely incomplete. And um, just to let people know in terms of the list that we're looking at, um, many of the towns on there um, are towns with under 1,000 students in the whole school system way out west in Massachusetts. Um, and there's only two within Route 95 in terms of the types of cost of living that we're talking about. And so we don't have the information for more local ones. And so I think um, I just don't want uh, people to sort of get the impression that that's a list that kind of provides some compromise about where we're at locally because it's not a, a local list. It's just what MASC was, uh, had on file and able to provide for us. Um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, what Mark has proposed is, uh, is reasonable. It would certainly uh, help me as someone who pays for child care when I come to meetings. So, Mr. Ports, if I could make one more comment. Sure. Um, in addition to what I said, um, Years ago, the school committee would meet once a month, probably didn't meet in July and August several times, and had very few subcommittee meetings. Today, that's changed. We meet an awful lot more as a regular school committee, as well as a number of different subcommittees that a lot of people here not only sit on, but attend. So I do think that it's, it's prudent you know, in the case of people that need child care, and we're not making this a, a full-time job salary, but I do think that people should be at least somewhat compensated for the time and effort that they've put in on to, for the benefit of this community. I, I would, uh, the, the one comment you made, I, I, I think very, very true, um, and it's part of what, where I felt that there needed to be, we needed to look at this. I agreed with the issue around looking at it. Um, because it is the case that, that we meet now um, probably four months out of the year, the calendar, the academic year, I think at least four months we meet twice, which wouldn't have been the case five years ago. I think we did it maybe once a year. Um, now we do it probably at least four or five times. And then we do, I think, meet more in the summer than used to be the case uh, five, six, seven years ago. Um, other comments or thoughts? I mean, I, the, the, the data that I, I, I sent around was simply to look at if you did it over an 11 year period, if you went back to 2008 and you look from 2008 up to today, you did over 11 years. If you did a 2% increase, what would that equal? If you did a 2.5% increase, what would that? And then a 3% um, as kind of different levels of uh, adjustment. Other thoughts? I mean, I, I, I appreciate the 4,500 um, that you're talking about. I mean, I was thinking uh, a little lower than that, but, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, the 2.5% the is basically 4,200 um, at compounded, and the 2% is, is about 4,000 compounded. Yep, Lily. So I think we talked a lot about the impact that being on school committee has on a lot of our membership and that need for childcare. And I mean, again, when you actually do out the numbers, most of us are receiving a check of less than $200 a month or about $200 a month for our work. And the cost of finding childcare for multiple meetings a month is exceeding um, that. So I think when we were discussing the numbers and what made the most sense, we're, I think some of us are just trying to break even um, and not be losing. Um, a lot of money by being on school committee. Um, I certainly don't think anybody would say that we're doing this to make money. Um, but I think, you know, as we're talking about numbers, I think part of the reason that we discussed the 4,500 was to make sure that all members of the school committee would be able to have childcare as necessary for the additional meetings and the fact that many of us are doing additional responsibilities that actually go even beyond subcommittee meetings and general meetings, but things like bargaining and things like um, other wellness committee um, assignments and stuff like that. So I think 
where really our goal is just to make it possible for us to be able to have um, the ability to provide for our families while we serve the community. Mark. And to be perfectly honest with you, given the fact that this was looked at in 2008, it's 2019, it's probably not, and, and the council is the same way, it's probably not gonna get looked at for eight to 10 more years or six more years. So I do think that, you know, building in, I'm not saying a cushion, but I do think that rather than having to revisit this every year or two, and given the fact that there are constraints, that it has to be done within a certain period during the charter, I do think that it's reasonable to request a, a recommend $4,500. Other thoughts? Anyone else? Want to say? Yeah, Lindsay. Um, the only other comment I kind of want to make, thinking about sort of viewing it as a, a percentage of where we started 11 years ago, I kind of to Mark's point about how the job description has changed as well, I think it's unfair to categorize it as a just a percent increase from what it was 11 years ago because the job description and the scope of the job has also changed at the same time. And so to categorize it that way, I think is, um, while the information is useful, I think it's a little bit inaccurate to say that because the job description has changed, so. Any other, other general comments that people want to make? Anyone, Eileen, yes or no? I guess I'm not going <clears> to <throat> speak to the amount or any of that, but I think either you should or should not compensate people for this at some level. I think people generally are in agreement that you should be compensated a bit for expenses. As, as was said down at the other end of the table, nobody runs for school committee to get rich. <laughs> um, or if they do, they're misguided. Uh, <laughs> what I would say is this. It's probably fair after 11 years to think about uh, adjusting the compensation because the price of everything has gone up. And I think the idea that someone would be discouraged from running for, for school committee because of the cost is, would be too bad. Um, I do think that it's hard sometimes to come out and say, oh, you know, I need more money, but I mean, I think that goes with a lot of other things. Hard to ask for a raise. It's hard to tell people that uh, uh, it, it, you need more compensation. I will say this, that the members of this school committee work very hard. They're very diligent, they're very responsive to needs, and I would have no problem saying that a little higher compensation would be appreciated. Uh, I want people to understand that, as, as Mr. Sidera said, this is not something that happens very frequently, and I think that I think we need to understand that there is a huge price, not just financial, that people pay for being in any of these public service positions. And uh, now is the time. Okay. Anyone else? So uh, I guess look for a motion. I would make a motion that we recommend to the town council to adjust the salary of the school committee to $4,500 a year. Second. Uh, further discussion, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Otherwise, I'll declare it unanimous. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we'll make that recommendation to the town council. I, you know, again, it's, a, it's kind of a difficult topic for a legislative body to talk about raising its own salary. And every legislative body who does it, it's a, it's a challenge. But I, I appreciate it. I think we've raised pointed out a number of the reasons why it makes sense to do that. So. Excuse me, can I just add yes. one? And there is no other mechanism. If we don't ask for it, right. there is no other mechanism to raise it. Right. I, I just got a text from a constituent that said it should be 5,000. <laughs> so again, people recognize the fact that people, you know, members of the, these elected bodies 
do work very hard. <laughs> and and the, the safeguard that's put in place is, is you're not giving yourself a raise. It's for the people, right. and in this case, three people may or may not be sitting here right. in January, so it would, you know, that is one of the safeguards of it. Right. Yeah, it comes after, we're not, you're right, it comes after the next election. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Um, next item on, for an action item is the approval of a, of a private school. Um, the, actually, we've already approved the school. This is an addition of uh, grade, grade two to the Star Academy. Dr. Galston. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so if you recall, um, actually earlier this year in September, we voted to approve, or you voted to approve the um, Star Academy. Um, it's located at 70, 780 Mount Auburn Street. Um, they are currently running grades K and 1, and um, they are looking to add grade 2. So at this point, the only thing that um, needs to be approved is the curriculum, because the school in and of itself has met all the requirements to, to exist. Um, I have reviewed the binder that was given to me by the Star Academy, which covers all the curriculum areas um, and is well thought out. And it is my responsibility to evaluate whether it's comparable to what students would receive in public education. And I would have to say that yes, the curriculum is, is solid and um, is certainly um, equivalent to what it is that we would offer here. So I certainly make the recommendation to approve the second grade for the Star Academy. Okay, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any further, any discussion? None. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Um, disposition of surplus property. So we have a, in our materials, there's a, a three pianos, some chemistry tables, and a reach-in freezer uh, for disposition. I make a motion, motion to, to approve. Dis so moved. Sorry. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Ayes. Was there an aye? Yes. Opposed? I have it. Thank you. Um, approval of the minutes from the school committee meeting May 20th, 2019. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Any corrections? All in favor? Aye. Oh, sorry. I just have one question, which is when will the um, policy handbook be online? Oh, the new one. Yeah, I can't wait to throw out the gigantic pile of papers <laughs> um, that I have. <laughs> they go. Well, we, um, uh, we just signed the contract. It was sent in. I don't know what the timing is for that. I don't either. We can find out. We can find Could out. Could you please just let me know because I can't wait to have a bonfire. <laughs> okay. So we were approving the minutes, I think. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Right, thank you. Um, Next item is uh, building for the future elementary schools project, Mark? There isn't as much to update this time as there was last time because we did have, we haven't had a meeting. We are meeting on Wednesday evening to continue um, looking at designs from AI3. Um, I anticipate approval of the owner's project manager for the elementary schools. Um, and that's what we have on the agenda, and we're still moving forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, the high school? Thank you. Dr. So it, it feels like a relatively quiet time after the uh, 18 months of serious work that's been going on. So um, with the high school project right now, uh, as we've mentioned, we have our owner's project manager, it's Compass, and um, Compass is currently working on a request for services for um, the designer selection uh, for the high school project. Uh, we are on track to to be at the designer selection panel, hopefully on August the 20th. Um, at that point in time, um, the designer selection panel will go through the, the selection process. It might require going back um, for interviews, but um, that is certainly the, the direction that we're heading in in terms of timing. So no matter what, by um, maybe end of August, early September, we'll know who our designer will be for the high school project. So that's the update for, for that. Then the fun will really begin at the high school. Okay. So you're anticipating that in, you said September? So August 20th is, if, if all goes well in terms of the, um, the releasing of the RFS, um, we would go to the designer selection panel on the 20th of August. Um, they might actually be able to make a decision then, but if not, they'll do interviews. I think it's September 17th. Don't quote me on that date. Okay. Um, but at that point, then they will make their decision. So probably no later than mid-September, but maybe even as early as late August. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, FY 2019 budget update, Ms. Perkins. 
Um, the budget update in your packet, um, and for the people at home, leaves a, an unencumbered balance as of May 29th of 568994 which is 1.2 percent of the budget. Um, as mentioned, the salary um, savings are the result of um, some instructional aid positions that weren't needed due to students moving out of district or requiring placement in out-of-district schools, so that moves that to um, the expense lines. Three teacher positions that were unfilled, either due to scarcity of candidates such as the visually impaired or for current program needs, and um, leaves of absence, um, times when we had less expensive people coming in for retirements, uh, a number of things like that that were mentioned prior. We had savings and expense accounts um, from the lower than anticipated Minuteman transportation and tuition expenses. We budget for 65 and only 55 students were attending this year. We had some prepaid out of district tuition last year and the circuit breaker receipts um, the state had done an additional appropriation last April which bumped that up a couple hundred thousand in the fourth quarter of last year. Um, so all of that together is where we're seeing the uh, majority of the savings as well as some budget um, turn back I'll call it from um, the individual budgets throughout the district when they're done with their year and there's money left over and that all comes together in this report. Um, so we have, as in the past, we've um, entered requisi um, requisitions for some of the facilities projects. Um, some of them are on the CIP that are not borrowing, but um, that's been done in the past and we're looking at to see from some of the flooring and carpeting and different things that we can do with the end of the year funds um, to be able to take those um, off of the CIP and move things up essentially, which has been done in the past and I've worked with the town auditor on that um, a few times. And um, certainly all of the staff, all of the principals and department heads throughout the district have been asked to put in their curriculum requests for new textbooks for next year and anything else that they feel they need. Uh, the technology uh, that we had wanted to fund with end of the year funds that was mentioned a couple months back has been purchased. Um, and the athletics and performing arts equipment has been purchased. So this report was run including requisitions. Not everything has been approved yet. There will be some um, budget amendments to move money in between, but it's too early to do that because until these, um, we finish coming through June and approve the requisitions, right now some of them are in the unapproved stage, but they're still in this report of where we anticipate being. So once those get approved and we know that what line they'll be expended out of what cost center, that's when we would, um, do the budget amendments. So um, some of the anticipated expenses yet to be charged, we have unencumbered wages to pay on every payroll. That's been running about $100,000 on each biweekly, which is for substitutes, tutoring, overtime, things like that that um, are not shown as encumbered. We still are anticipating some curriculum material orders to come in. Some of them have since, but um, at the time of the report, we anticipated 80 to 100,000 in curriculum materials. Um, maintenance supplies and repairs come up almost every single day, so we have another month of those. Um, end of the year expenses for awards and graduation, and the reach in freezer at the kind of just died the other day, so the day I was actually writing this. Um, so we're about to get a quote because we have to replace that, um, and a little bit of additional middle school furniture needs. So as mentioned, um, the encumbrance for the ESCO, which I went over with the town auditor again today, that's in and that transfer the town will be making shortly for the 400,000 against the ESCO obligation from the energy efficient equipment installed about eight years ago or so. Um, and we still have an open purchase order for uh, out of district uh, prepaid under the you know, legal um, availability to do that in the law that we can prepay some expenses. So at this time, all all things considered, we anticipate that we will fully expend the FY19 budget. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you for that update and, and uh, for all your work on uh, making sure the budget runs smoothly. Um, next would be enrollment, Dr. Galston. So uh, we, we are ending the year um, with pretty stable enrollment for this last month. There haven't really been too many ins and outs. Um, and just as I mentioned at the last um, meeting, we're still watching um, for next year, just kindergarten. That seems to be you know, an area that 
Um, hasn't changed much, so we haven't seen any, any spikes in our kindergarten enrollment, but it is something that I'm watching in case we need to reallocate or move um, staff um, to make up for any, any additions in kindergarten. But right now, it looks pretty stable, and um, so I think we're in good shape for heading into next year. Okay. Yep. Sure. What are the kin the incoming kindergarten numbers right now? So I, I don't completely again and twice tonight. You can't quote me. Um, I do believe it's right right now. We have maxed the um, cap at the kind of at forty, um, which is typical right around now. And we did this the same last year, right around the same time where we said that the classes were closed. And if we had any people enrolled by school committee policy, they would um, likely go to the Hosmer at this point. Um, but I'm going to watch that. I mean, if I end up with, you know, five to six students, then that would be where we might consider opening up another classroom. So um, Lowell is at, uh, I believe, 78. So we're close to the 80. Um, and the Hosmer is still riding at 91. So there's plenty of room at the Hosmer. Um, so we're watching those two, two areas. And then um, as, as is by, again, policy, um, there have been some requests about people moving. Um, you know, they might have a preference to go into one school over another. I hold on those until August the 1st. But if that also helps to alleviate some of the pressure points in some of the schools, then I might move earlier on that just to um, make sure that we're, we're keeping an eye on that. But I don't see any great um, increase that would require, like, a full additional new teacher, but we'll see how that goes towards the middle of the and summer. We have five classrooms at the Hosmer, two, two, um, I'm, two at the Cunniff, yep. and three, four, four at the Lowell. Four at the Lowell, yep. Okay. So we have, two, we have seven seats pretty much. No. No, we have more than that. Um, um, 11 seats yep. left. Yes. Okay. Which is pretty typical for this time. It is. Okay, yep. great. Thank what, you. what was the number at the kind of that you said? We had 40. We're at 40. 40. We're at 40. Yep. So that's the that's, that's the, the, the maximum. Yep. For, it's the, for, in the guidelines. Yep. For the guidelines. You know, and and truth be told, I mean, we've had over the guidelines by one maybe one student. I mean, that would be something that come August if we get to that point, um, we would entertain. And thanks to the again the school committee funding the. Um, kindergarten aides, we would make sure that no matter what, in any classroom that had over the guidelines for, for kindergarten, you would have, well, we will have two adults in all the classrooms, period, because of the kindergarten aides, but that's something that would help if we had to do that, so, but nothing dramatically over that. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. I just noticed on the enrollment here that, you know, the if district, total district enrollment's gone up about 30, but most of that actually is at the pre-K level on the, on the yeah. total here. Right. So just K to 12, it's only gone up nine. Oh, oh, oh right, right, right. Yes. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So yeah. So most of the increase has been at, at from from, from pre in preschool, because it's it's um, early steps as well as pre-K. It's yeah. not just pre-K because those numbers have stayed very consistent. What happens with preschool is kids age in, and once they age in, they enroll. So you you are always in a state of increase from the beginning of the year. Uh, Does that okay. make sense? Yep. Um, yep. Because okay. preschool, they start when they're three. So, but they could turn three when they're, it's December, January, February. Um, so that's why that number fluctuates, goes up. It doesn't really go down. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, warrants. So we have a list of, of uh, warrants that were signed. And then we also have a personnel report, a list of new, new staff. Support personnel, people leaving, et cetera, um, and a list of people. Yes. So, any any questions on any of that? Okay. Um, for my report for school committee chair, just a couple of comments I would make. Uh, our next meeting is uh, June seventeenth, and, uh, and kind of in this continuation of kind of looking at what's happened during the year. Uh, uh, on the seventeenth, the superintendent will give, be giving her report on uh, kind of her, her uh, progress in meeting the goals for the year, for 2018-19. So that will be one uh, presentation for that meeting. Um, I also would note, just as a part of a report, that collective bargaining negotiations are continuing on. So the school committee has the responsibility on the, on the school side to uh, work with the administration to do those negotiations. And we're working with, uh, with the WEA, the Educators Association, as well as the, which, and then also the SEIU, which has some of the administrative and support staff. Um, it's, uh, it does not appear that there'll be a contract settled uh, for any unit uh, this academic year, 
So it will continue on into the summer, and we hope that we will have contracts very shortly into the next academic year. Um, another note I would say, we have a retreat scheduled for July 8th, and that's from 5 to 8 o'clock, and it will be at the Commander's Mansion. We do have, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not sure that we have that confirmed. Hold off We're going to have that confirmed, yes. We will. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to get it there. Um, but I, I, I'm open to other suggest suggestions of what we might uh, talk about at that retreat. I did send an email around. I think one of the topics will be just kind of re reviewing and uh, on the superintendent evaluation process. Uh, but there are other topics that uh, are open for discussion. And then finally, I just want to highlight, it was already mentioned before, uh, the senior awards night, which I think a num number of you have been at. And I think what's really, what's really uh, interesting about that and, and uh, you know, a great credit to this community is, you know, not only does it, does it kind of showcase the students, uh, but it really showcases the community because you have all the different organizations and um, families that, you know, from alumni and, and all different kinds of people who give awards and give scholarships. Uh, so it's a pretty, uh, you know, very, uh, very positive statement on the way Watertown supports public education. So I thank the community for that. Dr. Galson, report. Excellent. Uh, so as, as you just heard, um, I'll be giving you an, a, a very large report next meeting um, to talk about all the great things that are happening within the, the school system. Um, but I just want to uh, also echo once again the congratulations to the class of 2019. Um, every time I, I meet one of the, the students or talk to them about their futures, um, it really does feel like we are doing what our mission says, which is to prepare our students for life. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting two young gentlemen at the tuxedo shop the other night as my own son is graduating on Wednesday. Um, but hearing, you know, one of them was talking about going on to um, Bunker Hill Community College and was really excited about getting started and, and knew that he was going to move on past that. And I mentioned the fact that that's a great way to save a lot of money and, and still achieve everything that you want. Um, and the other student was, was entering into the Marines and it was just um, pretty exciting to see and hear just what their, what their future holds for them. Um, we have impressive students, we have amazing staff, and um, our students are, are really prepared for their futures. And if you want to hear more about that, tune in to the graduation, um, where we get to hear a lot about the successes that our students are going to have. Um, just a couple other little pieces. I know um, there's, there's been some discussion around the middle school turnaround plan. Um, that is, you know, we, we talked about it in a previous school committee meeting. Um, the instructional leadership team is finishing up putting together the turnaround plan, which is due to the state on June the 30th. Um, at that point in time, we'll certainly provide an update to the school committee as to what that, um, what that plan looks like. Um, but I do want to acknowledge the fact that we are, you know, moving around or working with um, some of the, the ways that we deliver services in the middle school to try to meet some of the needs that um, we're seeing within our students. So that is something that's, that's sometimes going to be a little bit challenging, but um, certainly what we're trying to do is based on what, what could be best for students. Um, and then last, I do want to mention uh, that um, we know that there's been some questions around school safety and um, security, uh, especially at the high school. Uh, one thing I, I just want to acknowledge very publicly that it, I, I understand that it can be frustrating in terms of um, information that can be shared with families. Um, we get to a point where certain things just can't be shared. Um, but I do want to make sure that people know that um, our, our student safety teams, um, our critical incidents teams are working with the, the Watertown Police Department. Um, we are exceedingly thorough with making sure that our students are safe. Um, we would never ever have our students attend school if we didn't feel that they were in the safest environments possible. And there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes, um, but unfortunately there's just a lot of limitations to what we can share with the community about um, events that happen. But I do want to assure once again um, that we always take every step possible to ensure the safety of our students and we are very confident that Watertown High School is a very safe place to be or any of the schools within the Watertown Public Schools. Um, looking forward to the anti-bias coalition meeting on Monday night the, the 10th at 530. Remember anyone who would like to be part of that should join us. Um, I inadvertently scheduled um, the, the June coffee for when school is way out. I guess I thought that we were going to have some snow days or something. So um, I'm pondering and probably will not have a coffee in June because there's just not enough time left in the calendar to do so. Um, but we will kick those back up again in August and I look forward to sharing with the community um, and getting feedback from them as well. So. Okay. Thank you. Any new business? Seeing none, I think of the announcements we've already covered. Our next school committee meeting is June 17th. Public forum, if anyone speak in public forum. Seeing none, motion to adjourn.
All in favor? Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you very much.